Basic English this. We look at random variables u, x1, x2, and so on, up to xk. You can think of u as the unobserved component in a linear regression model and of x1, x2, and so on as the regressors. However, the concepts that we are exploring here are much more general and apply to any collections of random variables. To keep things easy, let's suppose that there's only one x. So we have u and x1. What we are going to talk about generalizes easily to the case with multiple x's. To fix ideas, think of u, x1 as the population in our exam score example. U gives, for each student in the population, the effect of ability on the exam score. And X1 describes how many hours they have studied. In the following, we want to describe some properties of the population. For this, we assume that the joint distribution of U, X1 is known. We already understand that we can interpret U, X1 either as describing a population or, alternatively, as describing one randomly drawn student from the population. Let's follow the second interpretation and let's think of u x1 as describing the uncertainty from drawing a random sample of size 1. We can think of random events in a dynamic way. Today we don't know what u will be and we treat it as a random quantity. In the future we have selected a student omega naught and we see the effect of their ability, u of omega naught. Let's assume that today is time 0 and that tomorrow is time 1. We already talked about predicting u for a randomly drawn student. We learned that if we want to predict a number today, then it is best to predict the expectation. We make our prediction at time 0. Then we draw the sample. At time 1, we observe the sample student and we see by how much our prediction was off. We are now going to change the rules of this game a little bit. We still start at time zero in a state of complete uncertainty about u. Then we draw the sample. However, we now stop at some point halfway between today and tomorrow. Let's call this time one half. At time one half, we don't see omega naught, that is, we are not quite sure who we end up sampling. What we do see is omega naught study time, in other words, we see the realization of x1. Learning omega naught study time gives us some information about omega naught. Now we want to predict u. Before, when we predicted u in time 0, we didn't have any information about omega naught. At time 1 half, we have partial information about omega naught, and we want to use this information to get as good a prediction as possible. We predict a number. Then we travel the remaining distance to time 1 where we learn omega naught and therefore the realization of u. Our prediction at time 1 half takes the observed value little x1 and uses it in some way to generate a prediction of u. This process can be represented by a function that translates little x1 into predicted values of u. Let's call this function g. The function g is chosen at time 0. This means that we decide today on the optimal strategy for making predictions at time one half. So which function g should we choose today? We know that at time one half, some information about the sample will be revealed. The information that is going to be revealed is that we learn the value of x1. We then feed the information that we learn into the prediction rule g and it returns a prediction. This prediction uses the information that we have in time t equal one half. From where we are standing today, the information that we are going to learn in t equal one half is random. We can model it as a random variable x1. The prediction that we are going to make in time one half is then also random. It is given by the random variable g of x1. Make sure that you understand that by our rules for transforming random variables, g of x1 is also a random variable. In t equal 1, we learn omega naught and we can compute our prediction error. Looking at this from the point of view of someone making choices today, the prediction error is a random variable.
As before, since we don't really care about the sign, we can square this and look at the squared prediction error. We need a criterion that tells us how well the prediction works and that we can already compute today. Such a criterion is given by the expected squared prediction error. We like functions g that give us a small expected squared prediction error and we don't like functions g that give us a large expected squared prediction error. When we choose the function g and time 0, it makes sense to choose a function that makes the expected squared prediction error as small as possible. In other words, we solve a minimization problem where we minimize over all possible functions and choose the function that gives us the smallest squared prediction error. Let's call this function g star. g star tells us how to use the information that we will receive in t equal 1 half in an optimal way. You may be worried that g star is not unique or that the minimization problem is not well defined. From a former mathematical viewpoint, you are right to be worried. But it turns out that this doesn't matter too much. An intuition that assumes that g star exists and is easy to find gives you the right idea. Let's work through this for our tiny example population consisting of Alice, Ben and Carl. For everyone in the population, we have their value of u, so the effect of ability, and their value of x1, so um, how many hours they have studied. Also, we have for everyone the proportion that they contribute to the population. So 21% of the people in the population are like Alice or um, are like Alice types, if you will. So now let's suppose that we want to predict u for a randomly chosen individual from this population. So if we're at time period t equals 0, we have no information whatsoever. Uh, in that case, we know it's optimal to predict the expectation of u. So what's the expectation of u? To compute the expectation, we uh, weigh possible values of u by the probability of drawing such a u. And we get an expectation of a little less than 25. So this would be the number that we uh, would predict if we have no information whatsoever. But now suppose that we are at time t equal 1 half. So we see um, how many hours the person that we've drawn has studied. Now suppose that we see the person has studied 19 hours. We know that the only person in the population who studies 19 hours um, is Alice. So we automatically can, we, we know that u has to be 36, right? If we see 22, Ben is the only one who studies 22 hours. And so we know um, that u has to be 27. So in that case, so once, whenever we see 19, we should predict 36. That will give us a perfect prediction. Um, if we see 22, we should predict 27. Again, we get a prediction error of 0. And if we see 27, we should predict 9. So that's quite easy. But what if Alice studies 22 hours? Well, now, whenever we see someone studying 27 hours, we can still deduce its car, right? And we should predict u equal 9. But Whenever we see someone studying 22 hours, it could be either Alice or it could be Ben. So we will not predict 27, we will not predict 36. Uh, we will probably predict something um, in between those two numbers. Now that we have found the optimal prediction rule G star, we can look into making optimal predictions. In time t equal 1 half, we learn the realization of study time, lowercase x1. We want to use this information about study time to predict the value of u that we realize in the future. Using our optimal prediction rule, we predict that u will be equal to g star of little x1. For example, if we observe little x1 equal to 22, then we will predict g star of 22.
In time zero, we are uncertain about what information we will receive in t equal one half. We treat the optimal prediction that we will make as a random variable, g star of uppercase x1. This random variable is called the conditional expectation of u given x1. We denote it like this. Never forget, the conditional expectation is a random variable. If at time zero someone asks me to give the expectation of u, and by that I mean the regular expectation, let's call it unconditional expectation to avoid confusion. So if at time zero someone asks me to give the unconditional expectation of u, I will happily report the appropriate number to them. The unconditional expectation is a number and not a random variable. If someone asks for the conditional expectation of u given x1, I cannot answer with a number. The condition expectation depends on x1, which at time zero is treated as a random variable. At time one half, I observe the realization of x1. I can plug it into the optimal prediction rule to get an optimal prediction for this sample. This is called the realized condition expectation. It is often denoted like this. Recall that while we can interpret the unconditional expectation as a prediction, can also interpret it as an average value. The same is true for a realized conditional expectation. For example, the conditional expectation of u conditional on x1 equal to 22 hours can be interpreted as the average value of u for all individuals in the population who study 22 hours. So let's look at this again in the context of our little toy example. We want to compute realized conditional x expectations of u given x1. So suppose that we observe a study time of um, 27. So we can figure out it has to be car. So we should predict a u of 9 for a prediction error of 0. But if we observe a study time of 22, then we might have drawn Alice or we might have drawn Ben. We don't know. It's either um, of the two. So we've just learned that the realized uh, condition expectation can also be interpreted as an average over all possible people that we might have drawn. So here, an average over Alice and Ben. But we have to take into account that there are more Ben types in the, uh, types in the population than there are Alice types. So together they contribute 76% of the population. And so relative to those 76%, Alice has mass uh, 28% roughly. And Ben has mass Um, forgot a zero here. I'm um, 72% and that adds to one as it should. So now let's compute the weighted average. So the realized condition expectation in that case would be um, a little under 30. Suppose that in time t equal one half, we observe in addition to x1, another random variable x2. This adds more information that we can use to improve our prediction. A prediction rule now takes two arguments corresponding to two pieces of information and translates them into a prediction of u. Again, we can find an optimal prediction rule g star and define the random variable g star of x1 and x2. This random variable is called the condition expectation of u given x1 and x2. You can now see how this concept can be translated to scenarios where we observe even more axes. The concept of a condition expectation offers us a very precise way of expressing the notion that a collection of random variables x1, x2, and so on is uninformative about a random variable u.
At t equals 0, we don't have any information at all about the sample. If we want to minimize the prediction error, then we should predict the unconditional expectation. At t equal 1 half, some information about the sample is revealed. We learn the realizations of the axis. If this information is useful for making predictions, then we will revise our prediction from time 0 and we will now predict a number that depends on the observed axis. Suppose that the information revealed by the axis is useless in terms of helping us improve our prediction. And by useless I mean that, no matter how the axis realize, they will never provide us with information that we can use to improve our prediction. In this case, we will ignore the realized values of the axis and we will continue predicting the unconditional expectation. In this scenario, for someone in period t equals zero, the conditional expectation is a function of omega that, for all omegas, takes the value expectation of u. We often use imprecise notation and write that the conditional expectation is equal to the unconditional expectation. A function whose value does not depend on its argument is called a constant function. Saying that the conditional expectation of u given x1, x2 and so on is a constant function is a formal and very precise way of saying that the axes are uninformative about u. We also say that x1, x2 and so on have no predictive power for u. The following relationships are true. If u and x1 are statistically independent, then the conditional expectation of u given x1 is equal to the unconditional expectation of u. Also, if the conditional expectation of u given x1 is equal to its unconditional expectation, then the covariance of u and x1 is equal to zero. We cannot reverse the sign of any of these implications. Let's summarize what we've learned about the conditional expectation. The conditional expectation is a prediction that uses partial information about the sample in an optimal way. The conditional expectation is a random variable. Saying that the conditional expectation of u given x1, x2 and so on is a constant function expresses in a very precise way the idea that we cannot use x1, x2 and so forth to predict u.